Trump is set to hold a joint news conference with a fellow world leader, so he'll be answering questions. Reporters could ask about topics including the Russia investigation and immigration. This comes after a federal judge blocked President Trump's plan to end the DREAMers program, which protects hundreds of thousands of immigrants who came into this country when they were children, but without documents. The president saying the decision is proof that our court system is broken and unfair. So what will the White House do now? Plus, Republicans rolling out a new immigration plan today with details on everything from the visa lottery to the border wall. Let's get to it. Breaking news. Shepard Smith reporting live from the Fox News deck. And a live look now uh, at the White House. We're waiting for President Trump to hold a news conference with the Prime Minister of Norway. We're expecting Tres President Trump will take questions and will do so shortly. We'll bring it to you as it begins. This comes as the White House is firing back after a federal judge temporarily blocked the president's decision to end the so-called DREAMers program. The hundreds of thousands of immigrants whose parents brought them to the U.S. as children without documents. President Trump ended the program in September, and he gave Congress until March to come up with a replacement. The judge ruled that ending the program could cause serious, irreparable harm to young immigrants. The White House calling the judge's decision outrageous. The ruling came after just, or I should say just hours after yesterday's rare on-camera negotiation of sorts over immigration. The president today called his meeting with lawmakers from both parties tremendous. We agreed to pursue four major areas yesterday of reform. Securing our border, including, of course, the wall, which has always been included, never changed. Ending chain migration, canceling the visa lottery, and addressing the status of the DACA population. The DACA population, that's the dreamers. At the meeting, the president announced that he'll sign a bill to extend that program, the one that protects them. He also said he's open to handling immigration in two phases, DACA and some sort of border security measures first. And then, he suggested maybe even an hour later, begin comprehensive immigration reform, something that has conservatives in quite a tizzy, some of them. And he's still insisting on a wall, uh, not a complete 2,000-mile wall, as he said it, but pieces and parts of a wall, pieces and parts of electronic security and human security along at least part of the border wall in Mexico. But yesterday, he told lawmakers, and I'm quoting now, we don't need a wall where you have rivers and mountains and everything else protecting it, unquote. He added... We do need a wall for a fairly good portion. The Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer called the meeting encouraging, but he said people are rightly skeptical that a bill to protect dreamers might never happen. We cannot wait. We cannot tolerate delay. Delay is a tactic employed by those who do not wish to see a deal. Let me just say, promises that maybe in the future we'll do it particularly on immigration, have vanished by the wayside. Well, another highlight of the talks, the president says that Congress should consider going back to earmarks. We reported on this here yesterday. Earmarks are the provisions lawmakers tack on to spending bills to pay for projects in their home state. That whole, I scratch your back, you scratch my back, that's how Congress works situation that ended in 2011. House Republicans banned it then saying it corrupts lawmakers and encourages them to support bad bills. They called it pork barrel politics. Critics say earmarks helped give Washington its reputation as a swamp, which the president has promised to drain. But the president says earmarks might help Congress actually get things done, which they would. But conservatives were against that. Chief White House correspondent John Roberts is live on the North Lawn. Hi, John. Shep, good afternoon to you. You know, this, this talk about earmarks, I was trying to dig up where it came from. Did somebody put the bug in the president's ear that this would be a good thing to talk about at this meeting? I wasn't able to come up with any one particular conversation that got him onto the earmark idea, but it, it was told to me that in meetings previous to this past weekend, 
where he huddled with uh, members of the congressional leadership on the Republican side, that he had talked about earmarks. Probably somebody just suggested to him, you know, back in the days when we had earmarks, we worked together a lot more than we do now. Maybe the president just picked up on that. Now to the court action that happened last night on the president's decision to rescind uh, the DACA program. It was the federal district judge out of San Francisco, William Alsup, who blocked last night the president's uh, action to get rid of DACA by March the 5th. The president clearly unhappy about that, taking Twitter this morning to say, quote, it just shows everyone how broken and unfair our court system is when the opposing side in a case such as DACA always runs to the Ninth Circuit and almost always wins before being reversed by higher courts. Now, again, Alsup is a federal district judge, but he is in the Ninth Circuit's uh, jurisdiction. And a lot of people, the president says, take uh, cases there because they know they're going to get a favorable ruling, although often overturned by the Supreme Court. But what the president said was actually tame in comparison to what the press secretary said earlier today about that ruling, saying, quote, we find this decision to be outrageous, especially in light of the president's successful bipartisan meeting with House and Senate members at the White House on the same day. An issue of this magnitude must go through the normal legislative process. And while there was agreement in both the House and Senate on the Democratic and Republican side that something needs to be done about the Dreamers, the judge got some support in the form of Vermont Senator Patrick Leahy. Listen here. The president should have worked with Congress. He should have found a permanent legislative solution while keeping DACA protections in place. I believe he terminated the program under false pretenses. He yielded to xenophobic voices in his, in his administration. Now, the president contends that it was unconstitutional for President Obama back in 2010 to make a, an executive decision about the Dreamers. He says that immigration has to be done by Congress, which is why the president threw it back to Congress on September the 5th. Yesterday, Shep, at about this time, we were talking about that extraordinary demonstration of democracy where the president allowed cameras to stay in the room for almost an entire meeting between himself and 22 members of Congress. Uh, the president today, meeting with his cabinet, said he got high marks for doing that. Listen here. My performance, uh, you know, some of them called it a performance. I consider it work. But got great reviews by everybody other than two networks who were phenomenal for about two hours. <laughs> then after that, they were called by their bosses and say, oh, wait a minute. And unfortunately, a lot of those anchors sent us letters saying that was one of the greatest meetings they've ever witnessed. Well, it wasn't really in the form of lettership. It was more tweets and on-air comments, uh, most of them remarking on the extraordinary scene that we saw there yesterday of having the meeting opened up to cameras for the most part. Jeff? John, thanks. Also today, President Trump says his administration is taking a look at libel laws. He says they're a sham and a disgrace. This comes after the, uh, the controversial new book from author Michael Wolff, who had inside access to the White House, who was given inside access by the president. Wolf's book offers a negative account of the Trump administration and portrays the president as unengaged and unfit to be commander in chief. The president has called the book a work of fiction. Back to John Roberts at the White House. He can look at the law, but when he looks at it, it won't change because he can't change the laws, right? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's difficult to do that. But he, he would obviously have to get Congress on, on board to do it. But this is something, Shep, that the uh, president has been talking about uh, for a long time now. All the way back during the campaign when a lot of those stories surfaced and he said that people can say anything that they want about anybody with, without any kind of recourse in the part of the person who he believes has been damaged. He talked about that a little bit more at the cabinet meeting today. Let's listen to what he said. We are going to take a strong look at our country's libel laws so that when somebody says something that is false and defamatory about someone, that person will have meaningful recourse in our courts. If somebody says something that's totally false and knowingly false, that the person that has been abused, defamed, libeled, will have meaningful recourse. In addition to the president believing that our current libel laws are a sham and a disgrace, as uh, you pointed out, Shep, he also says they do not uh, represent American values or American fairness. But uh, as you pointed out, the president can't do anything about this by himself. He'd need to get Congress on board. That, no doubt, will be a heavy lift. Shep? Yeah, it's more than that. John, John Roberts at the, at the White House. John, thanks very much. For clarity, because we're in the 
position to report facts here. Uh, that, all of that about libel laws, that was just a word salad of nothingness because none of that means anything <clears throat> except look over here. He couldn't change the libel laws. If he wanted to change the libel laws, he couldn't change them if he got the Congress in there. These are state laws, and that was nothing. John Bussey's here, associate editor of the Wall Street Journal, with which this neighborhood network shares common ownership. It, it's not, it's, it's, a, it's state laws. Right. It's two things. Uh, it's interesting. First off, let's, uh, it's, this is not a sham, and it's not a uh, disgrace. Our libel laws are here to protect, and they do a pretty effective job of that. Speaking from a journalist standpoint, we're very observant about what has to be done uh, from, uh, to, uh, to not libel somebody. So they're not a sham and not a disgrace. They are state laws. The, the Constitution's First Amendment is what it's all about. And good afternoon from Fox News in New York. I'm Shepard Smith, the president of the United on Fox television stations and the Fox News channel on satellite and cable. The president of the United States is holding a joint news conference uh, with the president of with the prime minister of Norway, and it has begun early. Let's listen. Brave, treacherous seas in courageous missions of exploration. Centuries later, during the Second World War, brave Norwegians escaped occupied Norway to fight alongside of Americans and the Allies, including on the beaches of Normandy in 1944. Our friendship builds on this proud and noble history and is rooted in our commitment to confront the problems of today with that same confidence and that same determination, and I think it might even be greater determination. We've just concluded a series of discussions on how we can work together to promote a future of security and world prosperity, and also a great future for our respective countries working together. The Prime Minister and I are both committed to strengthening the NATO alliance. Norway has made contributions to the NATO-led mission in Afghanistan, where we are doing very well. It's been turned around as well as to NATO and NATO's enhanced forward presence in Poland and the Baltic states. I want to thank the Prime Minister and the Norwegian people for their participation in these efforts. I encourage Norway to follow through on its commitment to meet the 2 percent of GDP defense spending obligation so that together we can confront the full range of threats facing our nations. And I believe Norway will get there quite soon. Norway is also a vital and valued member of the campaign to defeat ISIS. Because of us, ISIS has now lost almost 100 percent of the territory it previously held not so long ago in Iraq and in Syria. We're grateful for Norway's civilian assistance efforts and generous humanitarian aid to the region. They've been out there and really doing an incredible job. I'm also pleased to share that the economic ties between our two countries are robust and growing. The United States currently has a trade surplus, which is shocking. You believe I'm saying we have a surplus? There aren't too many. You're going to have to go back and check your people. But we're getting more and more surpluses all over the world, I will say that. I told that to the Prime Minister. But our two countries are robust and growing. The United States currently has a, a large contingent of products that we sell and back and forth with Norway. And one of the big products, of course, is our military equipment. I want to thank the people of Norway for their commitment to fair and reciprocal trade, a word that you're going to hear more and more coming from this administration, and it should have come from other administrations before me. Reciprocal trade, which benefits us all. Free nations are stronger when the trade is fair. And trade has not been overly fair with the United States, but we've had that great relationship with Norway. But remember the word reciprocal. In November, we started delivering the first F-52s and F-35 fighter jets. We have a total of 52, and they've delivered a number of them already, a little ahead of schedule. It's a $10 billion order. Norway also invests about one-third of its sovereign wealth fund 
in American businesses, supporting hundreds of thousands of American jobs. They're very big investors in our stock market, and therefore, the Prime Minister thanked me very much because their market is — you have done very well with your investments in the United States. Right? Thank you. Norway's commitment to mutually beneficial commerce is a model for other nations, and it really is. It's an amazing country. I look forward to forging an even stronger economic relationship between the United States and Norway, growing this record of success with even more investment and more jobs and more job creation. We're also proud of our increasing cooperation on health and health security, and also on biodefense, very important to both countries. I commend Prime Minister Solberg's efforts to promote vaccine development and disease prevention. Together, we can save and improve many, many lives. We're working very hard and, in some cases, together on cures to many ailments. Prime Minister Solberg, I want to thank you again for joining us at the White House. For decades, Norwegians and Americans have stood side by side against common threats to our freedom, our security, and to our values. Together, we have fought against fascism and communism and terrorism, and we face threats always. Together, we're partners. Our partnership has advanced peace, cooperation, and respect for human dignity all around the world. Today, we remain united in our efforts to confront shared challenges, to seize new opportunities, and to build a bright and beautiful future for our countries, our people, our children. And I think we're doing very well working together, and we have a newfound friendship. So I want to thank you, and God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you for your generous welcome. Uh, it's a great honor to be here at the White House. The relationship between our two countries is strong, and it has very deep roots. There are millions of U.S. citizens who proudly call themselves Norwegian Americans. And our Norwegian constitution, the second oldest in the world that is still in force, was inspired by American ideals. And we have had a long and continuous history of serving shoulder to shoulder on battlefields around the world. The U.S. remains our most important ally, a major trade partner, and a close friend. Today, we have discussed issues of, for, of importance for our a relationship, how we can keep our countries and citizens safe, how we can grow our economies, how we can further cooperation, the cooperation in areas of mutual interest. And I have assured President Trump that Norway remains an ally and a friend that you can count on in the future. We are already number two in NATO after the U.S. in terms of defense spending per capita, and we are making significant investments to further strengthen our defense. And this includes, as the President said, some big buys from American industry. P-8 maritime patrol aircraft from Boeing. 52 F-35 combat aircraft from Lockheed Martin, our largest single public investment ever in Norway. But also, we are buying new uh, submarines and investments in intelligence capabilities and army assets, and uh, which is important also for our job in the northern part. The American economy is doing well, and our economic relations are flourishing, and that's to the benefit of both countries. As we discussed in our meeting, for a small country like Norway, it's important for our ability to trade and to invest across borders that we have fair trade and that we have multilateral trade systems also. And we uh, think it's important for our future. Norwegian in investments and Norwegian companies support close to half a million jobs of, in the United States. And through our government pension funds, substantial revenues from our oil sectors are being investment, invested in U.S. assets. The U.S. has an impressive business uh, community, and I have commanded the leading role it is playing also in the transformation to a green economy. For example, by the fact that uh, one of the big areas we are now importing in Norway is electrical cars from Tesla. And uh, Norway is uh, combating climate change. It's an important issue for us, and we are committed to the Paris Agreement. But it leads to businesses and it leads to American businesses also selling cars in Norway. 
At the same time, the green economy is an area where we see tremendous economic and business opportunities in the future. And finally, I think it's important to say that we also are discussing some of the big difficult issues, for example, the development in Afghanistan, where I think and hope that we can find a new future. It's important that we are all working together to find uh, solutions both in North Korea, Afghanistan, Syria, and Iraq. And since September 11, 2001, Norway has contributed to a range of mission and operations, including the fight against ISIS. And I have assured the President that we remain unwavering in our commitment to the fight against terrorism all over the world. So, Mr. President, I am looking forward to future cooperation, and thank you for a very fruitful meeting. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. Okay, uh, some questions. How about Sarah Westwood? Where is Sarah? Sarah, thank you. Washington Examiner. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, yesterday, in a meeting with lawmakers, you said that you would be open to signing just about any immigration deal that that bipartisan group of lawmakers sent to you. That's right. Would you be willing to sign an immigration deal that ultimately does not include funding for the border wall, or would that be a red no. line for you? No. 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 It's got to include the wall. We need the wall for security. We need the wall for safety. We need the wall for stopping the drugs from pouring in. Uh, I would imagine that the people in the room, both Democrat and Republican, uh, I really believe they're going to come up with a solution to the DACA problem, which has been going on for a long time and maybe beyond that immigration as a whole. But any solution has to include the wall, because without the wall, it all doesn't work. Uh, you can look at other instances. Look at what happened in Israel. They put up the wall. They say solved a very major problem. We need the wall. We have to have the wall for security purposes. Security is number one. And uh, so the answer is, have to have the wall. Thank you. And please. Yes. Can I call on Anders Magnus from uh, the Norwegian Broadcasting? Mr. President, uh, Prime Minister, uh, recently an American, uh, American General Robert Neller told his Marines based in Norway, there's a war coming, a big ass uh, fight. Mr. President, how imminent is that big war and where will it take place? When you say the big war, you're saying what? Say it. it was a, uh, an American general, Robert Neller. He visited the Norwegian, uh, right. uh, the, the American Marines based in Norway, and he said it, there is a war coming, a big ass fight. When will that war come? Well, maybe anyway? he knows something that I don't know. Okay, uh, so I would say no, this. I would no say this. Coming. We have a very, very powerful military. We're getting more powerful by the month, by the day. Uh, we're ordering a lot of the equipment that. You're ordering, we're ordering it, but in larger amounts, uh, to put it mildly. Uh, we are building up our military to a point that we've never been before. Uh, we're also, uh, we were very much uh, weakened over the last long period of time, but not with me. Uh, no, I don't expect that. I think we're going to have, uh, because of strength, peace through strength. I think we're going to have a long period of peace. I hope we do. Uh, we have certainly problems with North Korea, but a lot of good talks are going on right now, a lot of good energy. I see a lot of good energy. I like it very much, what I'm seeing. I just spoke this morning with the, as you know, with the President, President Moon of South Korea. He had some really great meetings. His representatives had a great, great meeting. And I had some very good feedback from that. So hopefully a lot of good things are going to work out. No, I think that we will have uh, peace through strength. Our military will be stronger than it ever was in a very short period of time. And uh, that's my opinion. That's not the general's opinion, but I think my opinion counts more right now. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe I can just add that uh, the reason why we are so happy that we have U.S. Marines training in Norway is that that's part of the deterrent strategy that makes sure that we don't have a war in the future. Yes. And Sarah, did you have a question? You were supposed to ask a question. Did you have a question for the Prime Minister? Mm -hmm. I did, yes. Thank you. Madam Prime Minister, uh, President Trump has said that the investigation into Russian collusion makes our country, quote, look very bad. And he said this morning that, quote, the world is laughing at our stupidity. So my question to you is, are you laughing at the Russian investigation? I think, I think uh, that it's up to every political system in countries to scrutinize and discuss 
their own political agenda in their countries. And I respect that very much, and that this is an issue for American politics. I'd just like to say that it has impacted also in Europe. I think all European countries have, who have had elections this year has been looking into, will there be any type of tampering or others? We concluded after our election that we could not find any proof of any uh, try to, to, to uh, put any emphasis on, on that from, from countries outside, uh, outside Norway. I think it was a very Norwegian election with Norwegian uh, participants. Well, I will say this. Uh, there is collusion, but it's really with the Democrats and the Russians, far more than it is with the Republicans and the Russians. So the witch hunt continues. Uh, John, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I, I also have a question for the Prime Minister, but if I could address the President first. Uh, Sarah brought up the Russia investigation. Um, your legal team, sources have told us, believes that in the next few weeks, the special counsel, Robert Mueller, will ask for some sort of an interview with you, your legal team believes, as part of wrapping up his investigation. Are you open to meeting with him? Would you be willing to meet with him without condition, or would you demand that a strict set of parameters be placed around any encounter between you and the special counsel? Well, again, John, uh, there has been no collusion between the Trump campaign and Russians, or Trump and Russians, no collusion. Uh, when I watch you interviewing all the people leaving their committees, I mean, the Democrats are all running for office and they're trying to say this, that, but bottom line, they all say there's no collusion. And there is no collusion. And when you talk about interviews, uh, Hillary Clinton had an interview where she wasn't sworn in, she wasn't given the oath, they didn't take notes, they didn't record, and it was done on the 4th of July weekend. Uh, that's perhaps ridiculous, and a lot of people looked upon that as being uh, a very serious breach, and it really was. But again, I'll speak to attorneys. I can only say this. There was absolutely no collusion. Everybody knows it. Every committee. I've been in office now for 11 months. For 11 months, they've had this phony cloud over this administration, over our government. And it has hurt our government. It does hurt our government. It's a Democrat hoax that was brought up as an excuse for losing an election that, frankly, the Democrats should have won because they have such a tremendous advantage in the Electoral College. So it was brought up for that reason. But it has been determined that there is no collusion, and by virtually everybody. So we'll see what happens. Would you, would you be open to it? We'll see what happens. I mean, certainly I'll see what happens. But uh, when they have no collusion, and nobody's found any collusion at any level, uh, it seems unlikely that you'd even have an interview. And, uh, Madam Prime Minister, uh, Norway shares a small but strategic border with Russia. President Trump's position has been it's better to try to work with Vladimir Putin, if possible, than to work against him. Mm -hmm. Where do you uh, come down on that idea of better to work with Putin than to not work with him? Well, I think Russia is an important player in the international world, and I don't think you can uh, not work with and talk to. But on the other hand, it's important to say that um, we have we have aligned with all the sanctions, uh, as the European Union has done, and, and as a member connected both in NATO and, and, uh, and uh, interconnected to that. And we have also suffered some economic uh, um, um, difficulties in, in some areas in Norway based on those uh, sanctions. But um, on the other hand, we have a very good relationship with Russia over that border area, where we do have very much free movement of people, a uh, special zone of people moving to and fro. We have a, a very large cooperation on uh, sustainable fisheries in this area. It's the biggest cod area in the world with a sustainable resource, and we do patrol it. We do work together. So we think it's important to do two things at the same time. Yes. The international law is firm and clear. There was a break of that through the annexation of Crimea and the situation in Ukraine, and we still stand by all of our allies with that. But at the same time, as a neighboring country, we do day-to-day -day work on things that we have to solve for the people and the economic activity that is in that area, and, uh, which is a fragile area for the whole world. Just to add to the answer, uh, I think it is much better to work with Russia. Uh, it's very much uh, better having to do with North Korea, where we currently have a problem that should have never been my problem. This should have been a problem solved many years ago when it was much less dangerous. But it was given to me, along with a big mess of other things. But I will say this. I am for massive oil. 
and gas and everything else and a lot of energy. Putin can't love that. I am for the strongest military that the United States ever had. Putin can't love that. But Hillary was not for a strong military. And Hillary, my opponent, was for windmills. And she was for other types of energy that don't have the same capacities at this moment, certainly. So uh, I just want to say that it's a lot better to work with other countries. We're working with China or North Korea. We're working with various other countries, and I think we're doing very well. We had a great talk, as you know, and as you reported, we had a great talk this morning with President Moon, and I think that uh, a lot of good things are happening. Uh, we're going to see what happens. But uh, working with other countries, whether it's Russia or China or India or any of the countries that uh, surround this world and encompass this world, that's a good thing, John. That's not a bad thing. That's a very good thing. Okay? Okay. Go ahead. From Austin, Boston. Mr. President, uh, Prime Minister. Um, Norway strongly supports the, the Paris Agreement and have expressed regret that you have decided to leave it. Um, what could persuade you to remain? And um, what kind of common ground did you find in your talks today on this topic? Mm -hmm. Well, it wasn't a major topic, I must tell you. Uh, we talked about other things, including mostly trade. But uh, I will say that the Paris Agreement, as drawn and as we signed, was very unfair to the United States. It put great penalties on us. It made it very difficult for us to deal in terms of business. It took away a lot of our asset values. We are a country rich in gas and coal and oil and lots of other things, and there was a tremendous penalty for using it. Uh, it hurt our businesses. According to some estimates, we would have had to close businesses in order to qualify by 2025, whereas, as an example, China by 2030. They don't kick in until 2030. Russia, someplace in the mid-1990s, that was their standard, and that was never a good standard because that was a dirty standard for the environment. Uh, it treated the United States very unfairly, and frankly, it's an agreement that I have no problem with, but I had a problem with the agreement that they signed because, as usual, they made a bad deal. So we could conceivably go back in. But I say this, we are very strong on the environment. I feel very strongly about the environment. Our EPA and our EPA commissioners are very, very uh, powerful in the sense that they want to have clean water, clean air, but we also want businesses that can compete. And the Paris Accord really would have taken away our competitive edge. And we're not going to let that happen. I'm not going to let it happen. Just might add that there are business opportunities in this, as, uh, sure. as we talked about during this, uh, uh, because we have strict regulations on uh, to reach our Paris uh, targets. Uh, that means that we have uh, very strong policies for environmental friendly and climate friendly technologies, and which was, is a small part of why the, Amer uh, why the United States now have a surplus in the economy towards Norway. So to never miss up on a good opportunity with good environmental standards. One of the great assets of Norway is a thing called water, and they have tremendous hydropower, tremendous. In fact, most of your energy or your electricity is produced by hydro. I wish we'd do some of that, but hydropower is fantastic, and it's a great asset that you have. Thank you very much. Great honor. Thank you. Thank you very much. The President of the United States and the Prime Minister of Norway wrapping up a joint news conference. Uh, coverage continues on Fox News Channel on satellite and cable. For those of you watching on Fox Network and my local stations, we're going to return you to your regular programming. I'm Shepard Smith, Fox News, New York. Now continuing on Fox News Channel, uh, across the country and around the world, the President again calling the Russia investigation uh, a democratic hoax. It is not. Uh, Fox News has been reporting and will continue to report that two people have pleaded guilty. Uh, Mike Flynn, the former uh, uh, national security advisor, guilty of lying to the FBI about matters Russia. George Papadopoulos, former Trump foreign policy ad uh, advisor, guilty of lying to the FBI about communications with people who reported to be from the Russian government. Paul Manafort, the campaign manager, Rick Gates, uh, both indicted and the investigation uh, continues purportedly into Trump team ties to uh, 
to Russians and uh, potential money laundering and the rest. John Bussey is with us, associate editor of the Wall Street Journal, with which this uh, network shares common ownership. It is, when we talked about this during this, it is a bit baffling that he's coming off a very good day. Uh, as he mentioned himself, his performance was brilliant, and some anchors sent him letters. This is yesterday. Right, yeah. and, and he was riding this wave of goodness and cooperation and, and conclus con uh, inclusiveness, and, and now he, he blew it all up. Yeah, well, he turns, he turns it back to the story that he wants people not to be paying attention to. He so did it himself with his tweets. It tweets this morning uh, about the dossier and an uh, interview related to the dossier being released by Dianne Feinstein and criticizing her in very strong terms. After yesterday being across the table from her and sort of showing uh, a, a very nice sort of bipartisan moment that's rare in Washington. Uh, talking about uh, the need that our libel laws are a sham and a disgrace and they need to be rewritten. Why is that? Because there's a book that's out and it is criticizing him and calling him mentally unstable and he's angry about this. So once again, kind of by his own deed, sort of turning the conversation back to the topics that yesterday he was very successful in getting the press coverage and the public kind of mindset off of. It's, it, on some level, with some quarters, it works for him. Because, you know, my team, we have this Twitter thing, and the people are those who, you know, those who are with him no matter what, he should change the libel laws. The libel laws are horrible. He can't... He, yeah. He, he's, not a, he's not a dictator. He's not yeah. a king. He can't change the libel laws. That's yeah. preposterous. Well, the, the libel laws are set by 50 states um, and by the First Amendment of the Constitution. So if you're going to change the libel laws, you're going to have to get Congress to change the First Amendment. Uh, not only that, they're not a disgrace and a shame. They are very effective in protecting people who are written about and also those who write about them, uh, providing guidelines that you have to follow. For somebody to libel the president, they have to have a falsehood, but there has to be a reckless disregard for the truth and malice, yeah. malice associated, and forethought. associated with that. So, so there, are, there are rules. But even in this press conference, uh, the question from Roberts was, are you going to sit down with Mueller for an interview that apparently the FBI is seeking with you? In other words, are you going to cooperate yeah. with the investigation into the meddling that you say is a hoax? And if it's a hoax, won't you be cooperating? And yes. he said... Well, his, his comments were, you know, uh, virtually everybody agrees that there was no collusion. Well, I, you know, that's just not true. That's we're, absolutely we, we, untrue. We have an investigation ongoing. We don't know whether there was, and we'll find out eventually. Maybe there wasn't. Maybe there was from the investigators. Um, but, again, sort of churning over the issue, calling it a hoax rather than sort of answering the question. Ultimately, the answer to the question was, we'll see. But I don't think there really is reason for an interview, he said, because there was no collusion. It was a hoax. Yeah. So, it's a Democratic hoax. So, so we don't know what the answer to the question is. And I think that if you were president uh, with as much inclination to have the transparency that yesterday revealed, this really open discussing at time, a discussion between disagreeing parties, but very civil. Very at civil. At times quite charming. It was. Uh, if you wanted to show that transparency, you'd say something like, you know something, I want to get to the bottom of this just like everybody else. Of course, I'll talk to the FBI, but there'll be parameters on that because I'm president and the, I, I don't want to divulge certain types of information that I shouldn't be. In other words, you walk down that road. <coughs> Excuse me. I think I have a touch of the flu. <coughs> it would be very easy to answer the question in a way that was fairly truthful and not get yourself in any trouble. And we're cooperating. We've been, just say what all these people have said, we've been cooperating from the very beginning. We will continue to cooperate. We yes. want to know what the Russians have done to our system. He never says that, yes. ever. And then, and then move on to how cool it is that we're selling more fighter jets to Norway um, and that that's creating jobs in the United States. In other words, turn it back to our the positive story. Our new friends. Story. Yeah, turn it, yeah, right. turn, it back, turn it back to the positive story. Mind you, there's momentum behind this discussion that happened yesterday on DACA. Great momentum. That, you know, uh, Schumer's talking positively about it. The Republicans are talking positively about it. A lot depends on it. S the spending bill is kind of in sort of, uh, uh, in, in sort of temporary hold because they want to make some traction on DACA first. Tra traction was shown yesterday. Yeah. These are all positives that the president can convey. And he was doing great with Dianne Feinstein, even, of California yesterday, the Democrat of California. A back and forth and, put, you know, give and take. And then Dianne Feinstein releases the transcripts of the testimony of the former Wall Street Journal reporter uh, who is runs G uh, Fusion, Fusion GPS, GPS yeah. and produced the dossier, which we now know was actually produced 
for Republicans, a Republican website, as opposition research against President Trump until they realized President Trump was going to be the Republican nominee. And then the Democrats came in and started funding it. And, and we learned a lot. And none of it was very good for the president. And he just sort of threw Dianne Feinstein under the bus again today. Don't tweet. You got a, you got a lot of momentum from yesterday. It's actually substantive issues that are dealing with immigration, that are dealing ultimately with spending programs that the Democrats have kind of held back agreement on because they're waiting to make uh, using uh, DACA as leverage. You have all of that momentum. You have all of that positive stuff. Keep the story on productive things that Washington can do uh, in governing the United States. You know, John Roberts tried to get to the bottom of what are you going to cooperate? John, it was a forthright, honest, straightforward question. It was, and I specifically asked it like that, Shep, because I know that the president's legal team has been going back and forth with the special counsel's office about the potential for a request for an interview of the president and what they believe will be the closing weeks of this investigation. Uh, they have been talking about setting strict parameters for what might be discussed if the president were to sit down uh, for some sort of deposition or some sort of inquiry by the special counsel's office, which is, which is why I said, first of all, will you be willing to sit down with him? Would you be willing to sit down with him without condition, or would you want to stipulate that there is a defined set of parameters here? There has also been an interesting evolution as well in what the president has been saying about this. When he was first asked a number of months ago if he would do an interview with Robert Mueller, he came right out and he said yes. Then over the weekend at Camp David, he was asked about it, and he said, yeah, but there was no collusion, no crime. And since then, we learned that his legal team does believe that Mueller will ask for an interview, So, which is why I asked the, the question to the president in exactly the same way. It's also interesting to point out his reference to Hillary Clinton's interview with the FBI. And, and this is not just by happenstance, because there were a very defined set of parameters for that interview with Hillary Clinton, where there were no notes being taken, there was no transcript of it, there was no reporting of that that was done. And the president believes that if he sits down with Robert Mueller, that that should be sort of a precedent for any interview in the future. But it's also interesting, Shep, that again, he went back to this idea of no collusion, no crime, and therefore, why should there be an interview? Which, again, when you look at the evolution of that, the president's saying yes, then yeah, and today I don't see any reason why there should be any interview. It sounds like he is a, a little less eager to sit down with the special counsel now than he was when he was first asked about it a little more than six months ago. Which sort of makes sense, John Bussey, because if you, uh, if you uh, misstate a fact, uh, to be nice, if you misstate a fact and you're not under oath, uh, and that's one of the things he could ask for. You're not being recorded. Well, you know, it's one thing, but if you're under oath, it's pretty obviously perjury, and then, you know, that's impeachable. Yeah, that, yeah there, there's that, and I think, but, but probably no matter what happens in the rulemaking before going into the room, it's the president talking to the FBI, and the FBI will okay. have its own, at least, oral records of this. Uh, th this is, this is uh, tricky territory um, for a president who's had difficulties uh, kind of on the truth side of things in general and in, and in similar conversations in the past, legal conversations. Uh, and it gets back to this kind of whole notion of sort of attacking, attacking the investigation, attacking the courts for having kind of ruled on this injunction of holding back, you know, implementation of his DACA rules um, at the court yesterday and talking about the broken court system. And, and he said even about the libel law, he says you can't say things that are false or knowingly false uh, and smile as money pours into the bank. You know, he's done that. Um, and you lose your credibility in being able to criticize other people for doing the same. Mm -hmm. John Bussey from Wall Street Journal from the news side and, uh, and our own John Roberts live at the White House. Thank you both. The president again blasted Senator Dianne Feinstein, as I mentioned, for, for releasing. Some would say leaking, but, you know, in Washington they leak stuff all the time, you know. It's not like they hadn't been releasing bits and parts and before. It's just all out there now. It's transparent, as she put it. But the president is not happy. The president's complaint, her response, and what the testimony actually reveals. That's coming up. President Trump slamming the top Democrat on the Senate Judiciary Committee for releasing the testimony of Glenn Simpson, co-founder of Fusion GPS, former Wall Street Journal reporter. That's the firm behind the so-called Trump dossier. The president tweeted, the fact that sneaky Dianne Feinstein, who has on numerous occasions stated that collusion between Trump and Russia has not been found, would release testimony in such an underhanded and possibly illegal way, totally without authorization, is a disgrace. 
must have tough primary. Senator Feinstein said there's been misinformation about the testimony, and the American people deserve a chance to read it for themselves. The transcript shows Glenn Simpson, the former Wall Street Journal reporter, told the committee the dossier is not a fabrication. Our chief intelligence correspondent, Catherine Herridge, is live in Washington. Catherine? Well, Chad, the powerful Republican chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee said the ranking Democrat Dianne Feinstein's decision to release the Glenn Simpson transcript on her own is a breach of trust that could derail efforts to secure testimony from Jared Kushner, the president's son-in-law. These transcripts would have been released eventually anyway, uh, but I think it does create some problems. For instance, when you're getting people to voluntarily come to you, it may make a lot of people a little more reserved about whether or not they want to cooperate. Senator Grassley was also asked but did not comment on the president's tweet calling Feinstein names and on the Senate floor Democrats praised Feinstein for advancing the American people's right and need to know the full truth. I want to applaud Senator Feinstein's leadership in using her proper authority as a ranking member to serve this vital public interest. Also today, the president's longtime personal attorney, Michael Cohen, is seeking more than $100 million in damages suing Fusion GPS, who commissioned the dossier, as well as BuzzFeed, who published the memos online exactly a year ago today. On Twitter, Cohen said enough is enough of the at fake at Russian dossier. But the former British spy Christopher Steele, who was paid by Fusion GPS to gather intelligence from his Russian sources, was a known quantity to the FBI, having done sensitive projects in the past and credible, according to the nation's former top spy. Chris Steele was regarded uh, as a competent professional, dedicated professional. I think it speaks to his uh, instincts, his professional instincts, that when he uh, grew concerned about what he was learning, that he first apparently reported this to his own government as well as to the FBI. The White House has accused Simpson's Fusion GPS of being Democratic linked, claiming it took money from Moscow. We heard that again this afternoon to compile its research. However, Simpson says he has a wide variety of clients, including Republicans. One criticism is that Fusion uses law firms to shield their financial transaction ship. Yep, Catherine, thanks. We're watching developments on Capitol Hill where Republicans and Democrats are coming together to see if they can work on a deal on immigration. That's next. Lawmakers from both parties are meeting today to talk about immigration and government spending. This after the TV camera interviews yesterday and the discussions at the cabinet room at the White House as President Trump discussed issues with Republicans and Democrats. Our chief congressional correspondent, Mike Emanuel, is live on, him on Capitol Hill this afternoon. There's a new immigration republic, uh, proposal from House Republicans, correct? Well, that's right, Shep. It would do a lot more than just addressing the young people who were brought to this country by their parents. It's from four House Republicans, Bob Goodlatte, Michael McCall, Martha McSally, and Raul Labrador. And they've been talking about their proposal this hour. The House Majority Leader gave us a bit of a preview of their plan a short time ago. The bill by Chairman Goodlatte goes much further, deals with sanctuary cities, which we passed off this floor. Kate's law, which we passed off this floor, too, is inside there. And then he goes into also about guest workers, E-Verify, and some other things. So it's a much broader immigration reform bill, but it also deals with DACA as well. There was also a bipartisan immigration meeting on the Senate side of the Capitol this afternoon. Democrats Dick Durbin and Michael Bennett, and Republicans Lindsey Graham, Jeff Flake, and Cory Gardner trying to find common ground on the controversial issue of immigration, Chef. We're hearing about a possible plan to avoid a government shutdown, Mike. That's right. The government runs out of money late night, Friday night, the 19th. And so there's talk among Republican sources of the need of a short-term funding extension to give them a little more time to negotiate a long-term funding agreement. This hour, you've got four of the key players in both the House and Senate meeting. They're talking about immigration. They may also be talking a bit about government funding. And earlier, the Senate Democratic leader, Chuck Schumer, uh, talked about pushing for some of his own Democratic priorities. The Republican majority, which conveniently forgot its long history of opposing deficits when passing a $1.5 trillion tax bill, cannot in good conscience turn around and complain about deficits here. 
So you've got many Republicans here on Capitol Hill who are ready to spend more money on defense, on rebuilding the military, a dangerous world facing threats from North Korea, Iran, and others. They are less keen about spending 